So we have our first remote speaker. So fingers crossed everything will go right. So the speaker is Matthew Johnson, and he'll be talking about ScenePick, a study, a case study in engineering a file format for 3D visualization. Hello, uh, and uh, I must say, I just began by saying I regret that I can't be there with you in, in person today, uh, but uh, hopefully next year. Uh, but I really thank the, uh, kind of the conference organizers for arranging it so that I can give this uh, talk remotely. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, uh, open source library that I kind of open source from Microsoft and, and maintain and continue to maintain um, called ScenePick. Uh, you can find out more about it at this uh, URL. And it, it, it doesn't lend itself amazingly well to being talked about in a linear format because it's an interactive technology. And so, uh, you know, please, uh, please go to that site and try out some of the kind of the sample scene picks that are available there um, to get a sense of how it feels to interact with, um, with, that, with these artifacts. But, uh, but that said, um, I'm really excited to talk to you today about why we built it, um, how, how we built it, and, and, and some of the details in and around uh, the challenges of, of, of engineering a, a new file format for this sort of visualization. Uh, so first off, you know, what, what is it we were trying to set up to do? Well, as computer vision scientists, uh, we typically are stock and trade so images, videos, things that are kind of fairly easy to share with other people. So, you know, I can send a ping or an MP4 to a colleague that they can look at it, get a sense of what's going on with an experiment that I'm running and give me feedback or send me, you know, their results back in a similar form. But we didn't have a similar analog for 3D data. So let's say I was trying to do a 3D scene reconstruction where I was trying to figure out where the camera is and certain things with the geometry. Um, there wasn't a a kind of a uh, technology that had the same affordances. Uh, so we wanted to be able to kind of make it as easy as possible to experiment with 3D data, uh, to make it, you know, the creation of 3D data visualizations really easy, uh, like just as is the case with videos and images. Um, <clears throat> but the real kind of the tricky thing was we wanted to share this without requiring the person receiving it to do any extra setup. So if I send you a, an image, you can view that image on almost any device. Uh, without having to install special software. But that's not really the case with 3D data and visualization. Typically requires um, some sort of you know, expensive, often like kind of licensed uh, bit of software to view that 3D data that you have to install before you can experience it. And then finally, we, uh, so, so we decided to build something based on HTML and on the assumption that pretty much everything has a browser these days, including some appliances. And, uh, and that essentially if we built it on top of HTML and open uh, technologies like JavaScript and WebGL, um, then we could uh, make something that is uh, performant as well and that people can enjoy. So here's an example of, of kind of a, a, a typical scene pick. So this is one that's being used for a facial capture, uh, you know, kind of experiment. Um, so you have five cameras uh, and point clouds that have been detected from those five cameras that are being merged together into a single 3D representation on the left. We can also see frustums where the cameras are in the scene. Uh, the point clouds have been color coded by camera. And we also see renders from each of the cameras over here on the right as additional information, also with the same color coding, so you can tell the difference. And uh, the user is able to kind of turn different clouds on and off to inspect kind of the error. They also have this error graph that's, uh, that's linked to the 3D representation so that as they uh, kind of move through the uh, time sequence in this particular case, uh, they can get a sense of you know where something is off and then kind of zoom in on the data to see exactly uh, where the problems are. And so this is an example, but you know, all of these different components can be put together in any uh, you know, configuration. Uh, you know, there's kind of an infinite number of different you know, potential theme picks you could build, but it's all based off kind of the same uh, fundamental technology. So before we continue, I just want to talk about what ScenePick isn't, because I think it's important. So first off, ScenePick is not a game engine. We have no interest in trying to build games in it and making it performant in that way or interactive in that way. Uh, it's a data visualization uh, technology. It's also not a completely customizable photorealistic rendering pipeline. We don't want to build something that looks uh, kind of photorealistic and, and is doing kind of, you know, you know, kind of ray tracing and, and kind of high quality physically based rendering. That's not what we're building. We're building something for rapid real time uh, visualization of, um, of 3D data. And finally, it's also not a replacement for high end uh, you know, graphic software like Maya. No one's going to be creating visual effects for a film using this. That's not what it's intended for. It's intended for the visualization of 3D data. I'm just saying this because it, inevitably people, I tend to get questions of like, oh, could you write games in this? Or could you use this? And no, that's not what we're really, I mean, no, you, that's not what we're building. So we've tried to stay really focused because if you're not careful, and it is often the trap that a lot of 3D technologies fall into, is they start trying to kind of be everything to everybody. And we really want to make sure that we're building something that's primarily a scientific tool for visualization of data. So uh, building a standalone file like this, uh, kind of how, what's the kind of architecture? How's it, how's it put together? Uh, well, so basically the HTML contains, you know, some kind of boilerplate, uh, you know, kind of divs and so forth, but then also uh, two scripts. The first script is, a, um, is a bit of JavaScript compiled from TypeScript 
which is kind of the scene pick consumer library. Um, and that has, it's based on uh, WebGL and uses Node um, and NPM for pulling in JavaScript dependencies, though everything is standalone and, and browserified um, as, as part of the compilation process. And then there's a JavaScript script uh, that, that describes the scene, um, where essentially, uh, you know, this is the bits of, that are actually going to constitute um, the thing that gets shown to the user. And, and the key point here is that that scene is almost entirely described by a sequence of JSON commands. And so that's why I kind of highlighted this, because really, scene pick is these JSON commands. Essentially, it's a language specification for these commands. And we have a, a, an example VM that we provide and maintain, uh, which is written in HTML and, job, and uh, JavaScript that interprets those commands. And we have producer APIs that essentially compile those commands um, you know, from, uh, from either, you know, from various um, uh, client languages. Um, but uh, kind of there's not keeping anyone else, for example, from producing their own producer API that produces JSON that's interpreted by our viewer or their own viewers. For example, you could create uh, kind of a, a viewer in a different language um, that, you know, used OpenGL, say, on the desktop or something. Um, there's no reason you couldn't do that. Uh, but you know, but because essentially, ultimately, the, it's the commands are that kind of uh, kind of join it all together, and we're just providing kind of reference implementations essentially as part of this open source project. Um, so here's an example of um, of a scene pick as it's experienced by the user. So this is uh, you know so all the commands are run and they produce something that looks like this, um, and the user is able to do a couple different things. They have uh, this frame slider that they can use to move kind of through the scene pick. Um, I've seen we can have one or more frames per canvas. Um, they can be linked or not. Uh, they can be a time series, which is what they often are, but they can also be just different examples in a data set, for example. Um, and then we have this uh, you know, kind of bar down at the bottom um, that allows the user to control uh, their experience of the scene pick, for example, by kind of playing things through at a certain rate, and they can speed that up or down by recording it for kind of a, for sharing it in a more linear format, um, you know, controlling the volume of various different bits of media. And, um, and then resetting the camera for the 3D, because you can often get lost um, in, in a 3D visualization, so it lets you go back to a canonical pose. So that's kind of what it looks like to the user, but what's actually happening under the hood? Well, under the hood, we have these um, various different components that, for, you know, that, they, that they are interpreted by the consumer API. Uh, the top level one is a scene, um, which is kind of this root component that control, contains everything, all the different uh, canvases and shared uh, utility and shared resources. We have a, a 3D canvas, um, which is for 3D graphics, that has one or more frames. Uh, and it uses a shared geometry, so a, a, we have a mesh object, obviously, which is you know, triangles and vertices and textures and so forth for showing 3D geometry. Uh, we have camera primitives for moving cameras and placing cameras to the scene. Um, we have various uh, shading things, for, for example, changing the background color or the position and, and color of lights. Um, and then uh, you know, floating text that can be in the 3D environment, and then focus points, which allow you to say a particular point is the scene that, in, the, in the scenes where you want the camera to rotate around. Um, and that's kind of movable by the user. And then we have 2D graphics. Uh, so we've also, in addition to all the 3D stuff, we also support a whole range of, of 2D visualizations, um, including uh, kind of the, the 2D canvas with a frame where you can do this arbitrary drawing of circles and squares and lines. It's all done using SVG. Um, or uh, we have a dedicated graph component that does sparkline graphs to show kind of the uh, values of various quantities as they change over time. And then we have you know the user interface um, elements I just showed to you. And then, uh, you know, various bits of media. If it's, if, if it's media that's supported by your browser, you can probably include it in the scene pick. This includes like images, audio tracks, and video that you can incorporate and sync to various bits of visualization. So for example, you could have uh, a video of someone talking and then the 3D reconstruction of them talking and have them be synced so you can kind of make sure that you're doing a good reconstruction. And uh, here's some examples. I'm obviously not going into too much detail with these. Uh, just I want to kind of give you an, a feel for what these JSON commands look like. In each one, we say what the type of command it is, and then have a bunch of parameters essentially that describe what to do with that command. So you know, we're defining a mesh. We're going to send it all of you know what kind of mesh it is, and all, all of the various kind of binary buffers, and then kind of bits of metadata about it. We can create uh, canvases of various sizes. Uh, we can, you know, once a canvas is created, attach frames to it and set background style. For example, this is a 2D canvas. We can add lines and circles to a particular frame. Uh, similarly, for 3D, we can set the camera and shading. Uh, we can add shared meshes uh, to the various different um, canvases or frames. So the key thing to understand here is that, um, you know, so each canvas can have one or more frames. These frames are sharing geometry. That's how we keep this from being kind of untenable for running in a browser, is that we can reuse the same meshes or images, um, you know, from frame to frame. 
meaning that these kind of large binary assets, you know, a, a mesh or, 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 or an image or a video aren't having to be replicated on a per frame basis as they change over time. Uh, and we can actually, you know, when adding that mesh to the frame, we can, you know, provide, you know, various uh, rotations and, and transformations on it. Uh, so it's changing kind of over time. And uh, similarly, you might notice things like, for example, there's an arrow going from this uh, mesh on the left uh, down to um, this image which it's using is the texture. So we can actually even share resources between the shared resources uh, with an eye to keeping the, the file size as small as possible and as, as performant as possible. And from the implementation standpoint for the consumer API, having unique IDs that you can use for caching and linking uh, between frames and, um, and shared resources is, is very helpful for building a performant uh, system. So now that you have kind of all of the, a very kind of rapid uh, overview of kind of the innards of how this all works, here's the same kind of scene pick again but this time kind of labeled by the uh, various commands that would have created the, everything in it. So you'll notice we have three uh, colored spheres and a white cube. Um, those are all meshes, and they're going to be shared between every single frame of this animation. By the way, this is the getting started, um, like the, like kind of like the tutorial uh, scene pick that you can find on that page that I linked at the beginning. It's also um, on, the, on the GitHub. So um, the scene is all of these canvases together along with the UI components. Uh, the canvas, uh, the 3D canvas is on the left here, which has a 3D geometry and a viewport. And then we have three different uh, 2D canvases that have been that are on the side where, I'm, where I'm, I was kind of like manually projecting that 3D information into a 2D plane um, and drawing it as, as squares and circles. So that's kind of this. So this is kind of like the consumer API, the um, you know, which is displaying the scene pick in the JSON. But of course, these um, JSON elements have to come from somewhere. Uh, just checking time. So uh, you have to have these producer APIs, which essentially act like compilers um, that produce the, uh, these JSON commands. Um, and we provide uh, implementations that we maintain uh, in C++ and Python. Uh, and our goal with these was to make them easy to include and use in your own projects, uh, make them as well documented as we can so people can use them uh, without uh, too much handholding. And, and also make them performance so that it's you know more of a no more of a cost to produce a scene pick than it would to produce an image or a or a video uh, for doing visualization. So uh, I'll take a moment here to talk a little about how to, how this project um, evolved because I think this is kind of a good point to put that into context. So when I was brought onto the project, it was um, it, the project consisted of a standalone Python file um, that uh, that was being maintained and, and had been built by uh, Jamie Schott and my colleague at the time, and uh, it, he would essentially compile the TypeScript into JavaScript, manually copy paste the JavaScript into a variable in this very large thousand line uh, kind of you know, Python file. And then people would kind of copy that file into their repository for use in data visualization, uh, which you know, when it was a kind of a small thing that didn't have a lot of features, you know, was okay, except that obviously, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, over time, there was a huge amount of divergence that happened between all the different versions of these uh, scene pick uh, Python files. Um, as people added new features or fixed bugs that they found um, or got like later copies of it and then tried merging them with the previous copies, it, it got to be a bit of a mess. And so there was kind of a desire from the people that were using it. Um, and, and, and actually, one of the surprising things about having a distribution model like this is that you end up with people using it that you, you know, who, who kind of got a copy from a copy from copy of, of, of someone that completely surprised you, and they had them kind of coming back and contacting us, giving the uh, kind of the contact information on the top, adding, asking, you know, reporting bugs or asking for new features, only to, only for us to reply, oh, that, that we fixed that, you know, a year ago. You know, here's here's a here's a later version. So uh, so we wanted to have a way of, of making that better, and obviously the, the solution there was going to be to use uh, Python wheels and, and to make this um, a, a, at the time an internal library, but eventually a public library that you can install with PIP, uh, but. There was also simultaneously a big demand internally for a C++ version of this. Um, so that people who are doing C++ pipelines could also use it for 3D visualization because it was such a useful tool. They are kind of they were very jealous of their Python colleagues and wanted to use it for their stuff as well. So uh, we decided to kill two birds with one stone, re-implement the whole thing as it was in cross-platform C++ using CMake as a build system, and then wrap the C++ in Python um, and then and make the Python wheels uh, available uh, for the Python users. Um, with the additional caveat of making sure that that new Python wrapping of the C++ was backwards compatible with the old API, and so uh, so that was that was quite a, quite a task, as I'm sure you can imagine. It was uh, it was uh, one of the more fulfilling uh, things I've done as an engineer, just kind of getting that to, to work, kind of you know building that up and, and building the systems around that to make that uh, what it is today. Uh, so um, let me start by talking about the C++ API. So uh, as you can look at it, it's it lives uh, on GitHub, um, uh, on Microsoft's GitHub here. Um, 
<clears throat> you can uh, basically it starts off by using npm to build the JavaScript library, and then everything else is um, is run uh, with CMake to do building and testing. And um, one one of the things I love about coming to RSCon, which is why I'm really uh, it's a shame that I that I wasn't able to make it this year, um, is hearing kind of the tips, tricks, you know, kind of interesting ways that people solve difficult problems they came across. So I thought I'd do my best to show some of those um, from the journey that we went on with this library. Um, and so I'm going to talk about three particular ones here for the C++ API, um, and I'll do a similar thing for the Python API. So the first step I want to talk about uh, you know, dependencies, obviously, uh, doing if you're working with CMake, um, there's kind of a, a question of, you know, what's the best way to uh, do your um, dependency management? And at the time, Fetch content was, uh, you know, experimental, but it's now becoming a pretty, pretty standard very quickly. Um, and I'm glad we chose to go with it. Uh, and it's a really great system if you're not familiar with it for defining your dependencies um, and including them, and then making it so that your um, CMake project in turn can be included by a Fetch content by others. So what you basically do is declare what your dependency is. In this case, it's a PyBind 11 dependency. I say, you know, where the Git repo is, the specific tag that I want to have a dependency on. Um, and then the fetch content system will do all the work to, you know, actually fetch the uh, the, the code at that repo, uh, run its CMake uh, so that it's kind of ready to go and to be included uh, by my project. And uh, and then if I, you know, use the same modern CMake principles to build my own project, then people who include my project can get my project and my dependencies using this kind of, you know, kind of recursive kind of dependency fetching like you'd expect in a normal dependency system. So it's really, uh, you know, great for getting your stuff just to work out of the box. Um, in C++ uh, for people that are working in CMake. So uh, the one thing there, aside from just using fetch content um, as, a, as, a, as a tool, which I think is really uh, incredibly useful, um, is, that, uh, is that when you're kind of providing options, for example, like what things to build and, and that sort of thing for your, um, for your project to prefix them with a unique string, ideally the name of your library, uh, because that, that avoids collision with your, uh, your various um, dependencies. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about was the problem of embedding the JS library. So I don't know if anyone's ever run into it. I certainly hadn't until this project. But there's a, a limit, and it changes based on the compiler you're using, on the length a string literal can be in C++. Uh, so, and, and it was very much less than the length of the string literal that was the compiled JavaScript library. And so we actually um, ended up having to create a header that had essentially a vector of strings that we would then combine dynamically at runtime to, um, to, to embed the library. Uh, but, then the, but then we had a problem, so how do we create this header file automatically? And uh, we actually find a way to do it in CMake uh, by essentially reading the JavaScript in um, and then building that portion of the file uh, by kind of moving through the string um, in kind of 2048 byte uh, blocks. So uh, that's, that was a that was an interesting challenge, uh, but it, but it uh, ended up working in the end. And, and as a result, we're able to kind of include the full uh, text of the library in the um, in, in the in the, the, the JavaScript uh, in the library itself. And then finally, uh, Python binding is obviously is is the is the, the key thing here. So um, there are obviously different ways to do Python binding for C and C plus plus libraries. Uh, the uh, typically what happens is you have your Python module which has some you know pure Python code. And then some code that's um, actually just wrapping and, and calling into uh, you know C++ 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 code, usually for um, performance reasons. Um, and a lot of scientific uh, Python libraries do this, like NumPy and um, and SciPy. So uh, similarly, we wanted to get the same benefits, and in our case, make it so we have less code um, long term to support. And so we used uh, Py PyBind 11 for the reason that it's really that I think in my opinion the best uh, uh, option available for doing this uh, currently. So, um, so first off, uh, let's say you have this, uh, you know, bit of C++ code, uh, you know, kind of your optimized add function, and then um, what you do is you write a little bit of um, PyBind wrapper code. Uh, you can provide things like uh, module level uh, docs uh, and attributes, and also uh, you can you say kind of what you want to uh, define as your Python function. In this case, I just want to alias the add function and uh, give it a, a some documentation so people know what it is, um, and then I can include that. In Python code, so I could essentially say, okay, from my kind of compiled uh, module, I want to import that add function. In this case, I'm using some pure Python to involve, to uh, implement subtract using this kind of optimized add function. So, uh, and and that's kind of and it's really that that's that's kind of it. It's 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 uh, it's magical in terms of the uh, it, doing it other in, in other ways. Is it involves so much more work, whereas just having to write this one kind of bit of blue code to tell the PyBind 11 system how to construct the kind of uh, Python wrapped um, module is just uh, is just really great. So highly recommended if you've not seen that before. 
Um, speaking of the Python API, uh, I'll, I'll get to you know, get, get the details on that. So uh, you can find it, uh, the, the Python wheels are hosted at, um, at uh, PyPy under the project ScenePic. Uh, I think we support all major architectures and most recent Python versions now. Uh, we, we had a bit of a struggle supporting Mac uh, Apple Silicon because uh, it's still not possible to build that using most CI systems. And so um, we now actually rent a, a Mac Mini in France uh, whenever we do uh, for a day, whenever we do a release. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, we built the C++ library as um, underscore scene pick. And then we use a couple tricks to make that look um, yeah, it, nice and Pythonic uh, for our Python users. Um, so the first kind of trick is wrappers. So what we do is we write a Python file, which imports from the C++ library the um, the kind of the C um, the C++ Python in, uh, uh, object in this case the image class, and then we write some Python only code. Maybe it's to make things more Pythonic. Maybe it's to it, 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 you know basically to kind of take a C ish API and make it more Pythony, um, or maybe it's to make take advantage of Python only functionality. Uh, like for example, the code from um, Pill, which uh, creates images from uh, binary uh, kind of you know, pixel arrays. Um, and what we can do is we can write those and then just essentially inject them into the C++ uh, wrapped um, object um, and to Python code to look as though they were there the whole time. So this wrapper could just you know, kind of import this object and leave it as is, or you can add in um, additional functionality to make it so that your library is easier to use and, and more um, amenable to use by, from Python. Um, but then you kind of run into this documentation problem. Most um, AP, uh, IDs at the moment have trouble kind of reading into the depths of C++ modules and getting out their help information and their doc information. And so there's these things called stubs, which until, again, until this project I wasn't aware of, maybe you are. Um, but stub files in Python are a really great way to kind of annotate uh, you know, libraries that are maybe were documented by their users or don't have type annotations, or in this case, it's a C++ uh, binary that, it, that, it, that the ID might be having uh, trouble you know, inspecting. So it's just implementation removed um, Python. So you're just kind of writing your Python class out um, without the implementation and then storing in a PYI file. And, uh, and then it, it basically the um, most IDs can then, um, you know, Get this information and use it to make the um, the user's experience more pleasant in, in, in when they're coding by giving them IntelliSense and that sort of thing. Uh, so this is another kind of really cool thing that you can do to make the user experience better when doing this sort of wrapping. Um, and then finally, I, if you've not come across CI Build Wheel um, and you do anything remotely like what I'm doing uh, for this library, then you've got to check it out. It's the most amazing project. Uh, so what they've done is they built something that integrates with most uh, modern CI systems. Uh, so this is the version for GitHub Actions. They have one for Azure Pipelines and Travis and, and, and most of the CI uh, kind of, you know, uh, providers. And uh, what it does is you give it a matrix of OSs you want it to run on. And then given the VM that it starts up on, it'll download a Docker container and then build as many Python wheels as possible on that platform uh, to get you the maximum range of compatibility. And so, you know, if you build this, like this, this, uh, this job here is going to produce, I think, on the order of 20 different Python wheels for different versions of Python, uh, for different versions of Linux and, and Windows and, and Mac. Uh, and uh, it's just phenomenal. So uh, just an amazing bit of work uh, that they've done there. And, um, and with that, um, I just want to thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll leave you with the uh, the URL to the library and um, ask for any questions. Thanks. Let's open up Slido so, here. Thank you. Uh, so as a reminder, please do ask questions on Slido. And before we set everything up, uh, maybe can I ask you, did you, uh, what did you have to do to make it open source from within Microsoft? That's a great question. Um, so the it, it maybe you might surprise people to hear it, but the open source uh, process at Microsoft is really easy now. Um, uh, the, the company kind of did a complete uh, kind of 180 turn on um, on its open source uh, kind of you know stance years ago now, and it's and it's now quite streamlined. So essentially, uh, you know, we had it the, when the library was internal; it was called SVT, um, and I you know kind of opened up a case to open source it. Um, using a easy to use tool, explaining why I wanted to do it and why I felt the community would benefit. Um, and the, uh, you know, it was reviewed kind of that day. 
Uh, I had to make sure that I complied with uh, governance to ensure that I wasn't misusing uh, third-party code or open source software and that it was clearly noted and licensed uh, to ensure that, you know, when we released that we were in full compliance with all open source licenses. Uh, and so there was a whole kind of uh, compliance suite that was done to ensure that I was doing that. Uh, and then uh, basically it just went live on the Microsoft GitHub. It was, uh, I think the whole process took maybe two or three weeks of which most of it was me just cleaning things up and doing kind of massive renamings. I don't know if you ever had to rename a project, but it's a huge pain. Uh, so I have to you know, change all the documentation and all the class names and everything to, to reference the new name scene pick. Now, actually, honestly, that was the longest part of the project was getting the name approved. Um, because we, there, we have a strict policy that we shouldn't use names which mask other um, open source efforts. So um, we have to use names that are kind of unique and different, um, that, but that still describe um, what the project is and don't violate any trademarks or, or, um, or copyrights, um, <laughs> which makes choosing a name very hard. Um, but, uh, but that was actually the biggest part of the struggle was finding a name that everybody agreed on that, uh, that was good. So let's go back to some of the questions we got on Slido. So the first okay. one is how simple is too simple to be worth using scene pick? Should I, could I use it for 3d scatter plots? Totally. No, no, no. I mean, like it's, it's so it, basically if, I mean, if you, if you go and look at the tutorial on, um, on, on, uh, on our web page, um, you can see that we have a, um, a, a, a for Python especially, we have a, tu a Python tutorial um, that's a Jupyter Notebook. We, we, we fully work with Jupyter Notebooks. You can have a couple of lines of Python, and it spits out a lovely scene pic that you can visualize right there live in the Jupyter Notebook. So absolutely, small visualizations, large visualizations, it's, um, it, we, we built it specifically to be used for any number of different kinds of things. So like 3D point clouds is absolutely something that we, um, that, 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 we, uh, that we love to support. And we can actually support tens of, ten, I think hundreds of thousands of points um, because we, uh, we use um, GL instancing. So, so yeah, go for it. So next question, the UI controls involve a mouse wheel, which I don't have. Is that something I can change as a user? That's a great question. So um, at the moment, no, but it's something that we are absolutely online to. Um, it, it's, it's something which we're very aware of is allowing um, different accessibility things to be toggled on and off and, and different options. There is There are keyboard controls. So everything that you can do with the mouse can also be done with the keyboard. Um, but, uh, but that said, that also doesn't necessarily work for everybody. So uh, accessibility is something that we could be better on, um, and uh, in, in particular, allowing kind of mapping of different input controls um, to, for, for controllability is something that's on our roadmap. And there is another question on accessibility. Uh, how much attention has gone towards user accessibility in the HTML output? Uh, so it's a, again, it's, it's a really great question. Um, in particular because um, what we're building, which is a 3D visualization suite, is something that's so inherently visual. Um, and so uh, there's just a lot of accessibility questions which are hard to answer about how to make you know, various visualizations more accessible. Um, and, you know, and for example, you know, it's not clear how well we could integrate a screen reader with it, um, you know, for, for, you know it, it, and how one would in a sense, it's almost an AI complete problem describing what's happening in the in, in the visualization live using text. It's a very interesting problem, um, but uh, but not one that we necessarily um, have been able to tackle yet. But uh, but that's absolutely. I mean, like I said, like I mean, for Microsoft, accessibility is something that's always top of mind and and uh, and something that I think that we could. Um, engage with uh, more. I mean, to be fair, I keep on saying we. It's just me. Uh, I, so, um, so, so any faults are mine. Um, and any can uh, send work to be done request. will also be done by me. So, so it's something I do care about very deeply. So, I, I, I do uh, want to work on it more. Yeah, it's open source. Anyone can send a pull request. <laughs> oh yes, of course. That's the, that's exactly how open source works. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's the answer no one likes. <laughs> so maybe last question, and for other questions that people might have, uh, please do get in touch with Matt outside of the session. Uh, can you do a static image export, for example, a PDF of a particular frame in an animation for papers? Absolutely. Uh, so, no, so the recording button actually records a, 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 a folder that gets saved as a zip to your local drive that has, a, 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 for every single frame, um, uh, kind of an image. And you can also, so at any point in time, right click on any of the canvases and export them as images in their current state. Okay, let's thank Matt again and thank you for doing a remote presentation. <laughs> thank you for supporting me. <laughs>